today. So I'm uh, also pondering what I'm doing, I'm a little behind and making a decision about the rest of the winter and fall adult and time and Bible study time for Sunday mornings. Uh, I'm close to pondering and deciding to have us do almost a year walk through the book of Romans. Woo! You know? Go big or go home, right? <laughs> so, um, such an important book, and there's a lot of interesting new perspectives, some good, some not so good in my estimation, but um, it's, it's just a, a, an incredible, um, incredibly important epistle that Paul wrote. I think it's his basic theology, and um, anyway, that's one thing I'm thinking about. But maybe today something will surface that you really want to study, um, and we can work on that. I know you guys love history of the Bible type stuff, and canon development, all of those kinds of things, and who knows, maybe we can work on that. So if you have strong feelings, I'm totally open to that. So, however, um, today we're going to do an open forum. So, you know, this, we go anywhere, wherever you go, we go. And if you ask a question I don't really want to talk about, I'll do it short. And you want. <laughs> so, um, but no. So, I always enjoy this, and, and maybe this is a kind of fun way to get us back in the groove after Christmas. I think we had a fabulous celebration of Christmas at SLC this year. Um, and so, anyway. So, there you go. I know I sent out an email, by the way. If you don't get an email um, on this specific class, most weeks I send out a reminder of the topic. Most weeks, that means that you're simply not on the subgroup of one who attends this class. The best way to get on that subgroup email, if you want to, is to email Bruce um, at slc at silverdalelooper.org. And ask him, can you put me on Pastor Bill's Sunday morning class? So if you're not getting a specific email and you want one, um, send Bruce an email because we keep updating that list. Okay? All right. With that, Ben. Um, as far as people, yes. Yes. Our lay school is a, going to be a visiting um, New Testament professor from Warford Seminary that Mary thinks very highly of. He's going to be coming, and you'll be getting some more publicity about the specifics. Well, so, could that be in Toronto? Um, it could. It could. Yeah, it could. But great, great, uh, great fun. Um, I've been conversing with him about what, where we're going to zero in. He's written a new book, and he wants to bring some of the stuff from his new book. Um, and I can say, Marietta is one of her favorite professors from Warburg, so... So we thought that was a perfect combo. So thank you. Yeah. So more info will be coming shortly on that. So, all right, with that, questions, anything and everything, um, get us rolling. Okay, Doug, and if we can have a mic, go to Doug, and then Barb in the back after Doug. All right. And I, I'm going to bounce back and forth from my iPad to the, the Bible, depending on what we need. Okay. Okay, well, this could be a short one. Because either you, it's easy to answer or you don't want to talk about it. <laughs> but um, but uh, was in, um, in Hebrews, it talks about um, the Melchizedek, the priest. Melchizedek, oh, yes. Melchizedek, yeah, thank you. Easy for you to say. <laughs> okay. And uh, you know, compares Jesus to Melchizedek. Yes. And talks about, you know, so who is this? Who was this Melchizedek guy? Back in Genesis. So did you hear the question? Okay, so we're going to go to... Um, the Barbara's next. So we're going to go to, instead of Hebrews, um, although we can look at it in Hebrews as well, um, I want to go to Genesis. Um, what is it? I think it's four. Somewhere um, it's after this. It was with Abraham. Yeah, because he blesses Abraham. Yep. So that would be after the flood, the whole business. 
Yeah, so we got to go in here. Yeah, that, that blessing is referred to in Hebrews passage. Yes, but I wanted to just have people read this very quickly. The flood subsides, covenant with Noah, and then we've got Abraham. This shows up on the scene. We got yeah, ch chapter twelve. I'm thinking, but Tower of Babel, chapter eleven, call of Abraham. Okay, so God calls Abraham, and then Abraham and Sarai head off. Let's see. I guess I could have just looked it up in the Bible. <laughs> uh, how do you spell that, Doug? <laughs> there you are. Melchizedek. All right. So Genesis 14. There we go. Um, after his return from the defeat of Chedorlaomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaba, that is the king's valley, and King Melchizedek of Salem brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of God most high. Now, who is this Melchizedek guy? And um, the truth is that we're not exactly sure, but this king just shows up and he blesses, um, he blesses Abram. And so you don't hear anything about him afterwards for the most part, maybe one reference. And so we just have this story of a priest anointing, blessing Abram. Um, and, and so then in Hebrews, uh, there's a reference in Psalm 110.4. That's the only other spot. So then in Hebrews, we hear uh, a reference and a quote from that talking about Jesus. So let's pick up here in Hebrews 5. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest. In the book of Hebrews, well, and also we talk about Jesus as um, prophet, priest, and king. There's been a lot of systematic theologies that will um, use those three to talk about who was Christology, who is Jesus. Prophet, yes, priest, because he's not just a prophet. Priest and king. Um, and so when you think about Jesus as the priest, the what did the priest do for the people? He offered sacrifice. Well, of course, with Jesus, he's not only the priest who offers the sacrifice, but he yeah. is the sacrifice. So, here's the confession from Hebrews. So, also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but as appointed by, by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Um, that is a quote from Psalm 2. And as he also says in another place, it's, I love that it says another place, um, are you, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Um, so um, Abram is blessed as a priest according to the order of Melchizedek from Genesis here. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So the writer of Hebrews is, is really concerned that, to show that Jesus is the fulfillment of various important themes from the Hebrew scriptures. And he goes back to this mysterious Melchizedek figure. Truth is, we don't know exactly who he is. Say, King of Salem, some people think that could be a reference to Jerusalem, but, you know, I've heard both sides on that. So, it, this Melchizedek figure shows up, we get a reference in Psalm 10 to Melchizedek, and then... We don't even have any other references to any priests at the time before... Moses. Yeah, so, it, well, right, so we hear about a priest or a king, yeah. you know, a figure and a leader who blesses Abram, and and so maybe, I, I don't want to push it too far with Melchizedek, but... Um, I think he was the first 
priest figure mentioned in the Bible. Yeah, that, that might be part of the, right. the first. Yeah, yeah. But again, it's 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 really interesting because you have some of these figures in the Old Testament, and we go, hmm, what is you know what's going on here? But again, the important thing for us is that writer of Hebrews wants to say Jesus is the real priest um, who fulfills this. You know, blessing to Abraham. So, great question. Other people want to take a shot at it? Please. Well, do you know but, why the Mormons picked uh, Melchizedek order as their highest order? Um, I don't know that exactly. I've heard that, and I know they talk a lot about Melchizedek. Um, so, I don't know that answer. Does anybody else know? Because Kim? That's, Jesus is in that order. Because Jesus is in that order? Okay. The other Okay, and so this is a different priest. Yeah, two. Right, right. Okay, good. Please, Clark. Oh, was it not the oh. deck of king and prophet and priest of peace? He came out of the I can't tell you. Salem, say, the glorious question was it wasn't Melchizedek a prophet, priest of peace? Salem is, is um, Shalom um, in Hebrew. So. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Yeah. yeah, good, good, yeah. And so here we're talking about Jesus, you know, we talk about Jesus as both human and divine. We're talking about the earthly Jesus um, uh, in his, his role, prophet, priest, and king. And so we talk about Jesus as, as one who, who offered sacrifice and is the sacrifice. How could you do, Doug? Great, please, Mark. I got a Lutheran. Go real close, the mics are. Hello? Yeah. Okay, I've got a Lutheran question. Oh, good. That's one I can handle. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. We'll I'm, see. I'm hoping. Um, and it's about works and faith. Yeah. That's what makes it a Lutheran question, right? Yes. <laughs> so, so Jesus is preaching yes. in, in Matthew, the 25th chapter, and so he. Yep. It's, you know, as you've done it to the least of these, and the people say, well, we didn't know you were there, Lord. Okay, that's uh, Matthew 25, yep. Yep. And so... So there's there's no, he does Jesus doesn't talk anything about faith there. He only talks about works. And he sends people to hell based on their lack of works. Or does he? Or does, yeah. So, so... That's my question. All right. I love the way you guys just throw up these real easy ones. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me reduce the size of this a little bit so we can get more text up here. Um, and I'll just knock this out. Piece of cake, no problem. <laughs> All right. So, Barb's question is, what about this parable of the judging of the nations, the, the sheep and the goats? How does that square with the Lutheran doctrine that we're justified by grace through faith alone, not works of the law. Jesus seems to say that people's salvation, as it were, it depends on whether they were compassionate to those in prison and those not, in, and those who were hungry and whatnot. And, and this is a parable that Christians have used for thousands of years to say we have an absolute um, imperative to engage with those who are suffering and hurting. So, so we, we have that, but how does that square work with this whole grace emphasis? Is that the question? Yes. Okay. Let's just take a look at the text real quick, and I'll try and highlight some things. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, so this is that apocalyptic day of the Lord, then He will sit on the throne of His glory, and all nations, okay, now let's start there, all nations will be gathered before Him. Not necessarily all people, but all nations. Um, that, we don't want to press it too hard, but that, let's just keep that on the, on the hopper here. Um, and all nations be gathered before me. He will separate people, one from another, as shepherd she separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand, and the goats at, his, at the left. 
Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you for the foundation of the world. Now, an important word that I think should be held up here when it comes to how is it that, a, that Lutherans square this with Paul's, not R, but the Apostle Paul's conviction that it isn't through works of the law that we are justified and made righteous. Um, where, what is the scene? This word. Inherit. So, do you earn an inheritance? It's a question. Do you earn an inheritance? So, um, come inherit the kingdom prepared for, for you from the, you know, the, from the beginning, from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. And I was naked, and you, clothed, you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, and th or thirsty and you gave something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger, and goes on and on, visited you? Truly, I tell you, just as you did it, and the king will answer them. So now this is the king judging the nations. And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Now I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Get over here to the ESV. My brothers. Now that's the literal Adelphos in Greek. Um, Adelphos, which is the word for brothers, which is a word for who? Nope. My, Jesus is talking, it seems, did it to the least of these, my brothers, who would that be? That's the way it's used in all the other places in the gospel. Jesus talked to his brothers. Now, in the New Revised Standard Version, to inclusivize that, that's why the NRSV said, to members of my family. I think that is helpful because we want to make sure Delphos, brothers, that's a term for all of Jesus' followers, which included women. So, um, but this is a little part, Barb, that we missed. Mark Allen Powell makes this point. I mean, we don't want to push it too far. But if we look at it this way, what's the message to the nations? Inasmuch you did it to the least of my members of my family, not just the least of these, but if you did it to my followers. This, if you look at it this way, you did it to me. Jesus saying, my church, my followers, my disciples, I'm in them, and they're in me, and if you, nations, if you take care of these people, so is this a judgment, Barb, of all people regarding their justification and life and salvation, or is this a word of Jesus warning the nations about how they're going to per persecute or take care of Jesus' followers? You get to decide. <laughs> but that's, that's important to hold that up. Now, again, I don't want to in any way say that this is not an important text to inform how our ethics and how we live. I mean, my goodness. We, I do see Jesus in the least of these, whether it's a person who's a follower of Christ or not. I believe Christ is in my neighbor. There's plenty of other scriptures to and teachings of Jesus. Love your neighbor, love your enemy. You know, so we don't need just this text. But when it comes to how does this conflict with justification is a question. Now, the next thing I'm going to say about this text real quick is although it would seem that Jesus is judging them by their works, he does say inherit the kingdom because why? You did these things. But do they know they did them? No! They said, why did we do that, Jesus? Oh, well, when you did it, to the oh, they didn't even know they were doing it. And so what we would say as, as Lutherans, to make sure that we 
and see a, a, a congruence in New Testament doctrine, we would say, yes, these people had faith. And they, of course, that faith was active in love. And if you have faith, then you have love. And you have love for the least of these. And they didn't even know it, though. See, they weren't trying to achieve their salvation. They were just naturally living out their faith. My favorite so, phrase for that is the attitude of the heart. Well, there you go. Attitude of heart, it comes naturally, it comes instinctively. It wasn't because they were keeping a law. It was they had faith, which was, of course, active in love. So, um, so let's keep going. Then he'll say to them, depart from me, you person, to the eternal fire prepared for who? This is a lovely part of this passage that we just totally missed over. Not messed over. Went past, but not to, to have to take a notice of. What is hell prepared for? Hell, according to Jesus, is not for one human being. That's why it was prepared. It wasn't prepared for one single human being. It was prepared. For the devil and his angels. Now, I'm not saying that some people aren't going to end up there. But it wasn't intended for that purpose. So, because obviously, he, those, these people, these nations, and the people of these nations are going to go to the place that was prepared for the devil and his angels. But it wasn't prepared for them in the first place. I think that's important. But it's a, it's a little bit different than your question. Um, so he goes on, and I, you didn't do the things of the others, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. But the righteous to eternal life. So I would say, well, who are the righteous? The righteous are the people who believe in Christ, who are justified in Christ, and of course these are people that naturally then live out their faith. So that's, that's my bringing together of this really great parable and important parable. Please. But isn't this what Jesus told them to do when they they're asked, what is the great commandment? And love God, and then love thy neighbor as thyself. So they were doing the towards their neighbor what he told them to do. We would say that, yes, those sheep were doing what Jesus said, in loving their neighbor, and in loving their enemies, too. Because he said that, too. So, um, Bill, yeah? The question is, in all this... Here, here wait, if you're going to... let's. Let's give us a microphone so people can hear you. The question that's in it, yeah. The, the, the question. Go real close. It's on. It's on. Just go. The question uh, that's behind all this is what is the motivation for good works? Right. And it's not to earn your salvation. Right. It has a different motivation. Yes. Yes. So what is the motivation? The motivation yeah. is thankfulness for your yeah. salvation through your faith. Right. Right. The last beautiful, Barb, the last thing I want to say. Oh. Is saying on this question, can we get one over to Kim? So, and maybe I don't want to steal Kim's thunder, but the last thing I want to say is this is something I believe about the, the writing of the writings of Paul and the writings of the Gospels. There's almost universal agreement that the actual writing of the Gospel of Matthew, obviously Jesus spoke these words in the somewhere around 30 AD or so. Let's just throw that up for now. Um, but the writing of the Gospels, the actual writing of them come a little later. Paul is in the middle. He writes in the 50s, let's say. So he's in the middle. And I believe the writer of Matthew is, has a side agenda as he brings us the story of Jesus to make a correction to something that came from Paul's preaching. What is that? Well, I don't have to do anything. I'm saved by grace. And the writer Matthew goes back to Jesus' own words. He says, hold on here. If you are indeed saved by grace through faith, and you have faith, you're going to be doing these things. That, you know, that, you know, kind of almost a James-ish concern, like in the letter of James where it says, faith without works is dead. You know, this type of thing, which of course Luther didn't like. But, um, but so, so that's, that's the corrective to a, a, a kind of cheap grace, we might say. So that's that's another part that's a little more sophisticated, you know, a little more, uh, you know, but that's, I think, a helpful thing to think about. Kim? 
your sermon a couple weeks ago about John the Baptist and Jesus coming with a threshing right. Right, brought me so much comfort because in Anna, the person who said, who has that, and who has that rod in his hands is Jesus, and yes. we can put our trust in him completely to be completely just and merciful and all of those things that we expect him to be. Yes. And so that has, you know, anytime I read about judgment now, that has brought me so much more comfort. Yeah, nice. Yeah. And then the other thing is that it says in verse 37, the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when we do this. And you, you, you sort of said this before, but we're only righteous because we, Christ makes us righteous. That is not, Yes. we are not righteous on our own. Yes. So if we do these good works, it's the Holy Spirit working through us. It's not us. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. That, that would be the, 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 the that's the crescendo on the, the, the response to an excellent question is that for us we would say, yeah, even, but even when we did it, it's, it's so the, nice. the Holy Spirit. It's not us doing it, it's, it's Christ in us doing it. And if we've got Christ in us, then we're going to be doing it. So, so those helpful? Good, good. Uh, Greg, you want to add on? Uh, this is a total tangent, and you'll probably have to pull out your iPod. Okay. Um, is it a different question? Totally different question. Okay, hold on one second. So, um, the last thing, I thought of one more thing I want to say. <laughs> and it's in the blog I just wrote yesterday, if you haven't seen it. Um, Jesus preaches the law. Don't think that, Je that Jesus is just all gospel. Jesus, boom. When I read Matthew 25 here about the sheep and the goats, I just walked right past that guy in the street the other day. I just, I go, what I need to cross. So Jesus preached the law sometimes, and, but he is the gospel. Excellent. Great. So um, you mentioned about Christology, yep. and we talked about eschatology. Yes. And I know there's a lot of other ologies out there in the church. Can you go over some of those, like soteriology and uh, so on? Sure. Uh, is something in systematics. 
um, eschatology about the end. What about the, the parousia, which is the second coming of Christ. Parousia, that's second, or the return of Christ. So eschatology, soteriology, Christology, um, uh, you know, the other ones, although I don't, I'm not, the, the names aren't coming into mind, is like Doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Um, and a lot of these come from um, Philip the Langton, Luther's right-hand man, wrote uh, the Loci Communes, it's called. And it was really one of the, the, the first Protestant systematic theology that took all these subjects. So you start with creation, you start with God, um, you know. Uh, the, the other issue is what do, you, what do you talk about when you talk about the state of human beings? Um, it's an ology. But anyway, um, anyway, it's not, it's not coming. There's to one me, about the Holy Spirit too, isn't there? Sure, yeah. Um, but I don't know that it has the fancy, you know. Um, but so, so definitely in systematics we talk about the Holy Spirit. But the other issue that we want to talk about with systematics is what do we think about human beings? Because what we think about human beings, or humanity, Humanity. When we think of humanity, um, what is our what is our problem? <laughs> this is an essential thing in religious dialogue, and for that matter, it's an essential thing in public discourse and what social theories and governments we think are going to be the best. You believe that human beings are basically good people with the right education can bring about peace on earth. That's going to totally change how you set up society. Our founding fathers and mothers did not believe that. What did they believe about human beings? Fallen, Fallen bankrupt, <coughs> horrible, evil. That's what they believe about human beings. So what did they do? They set up the best constitution that's ever been drafted in the history of this world, in my opinion. One where everybody was watching everybody else. It's called the balance of powers. We have three branches of government. And I know it's a mess right now. It's always been a mess. And democracy is a mess. Winston Churchill said it the best. He said democracy is this and that. Horrible, horrible, horrible. It's the best thing. So, so, but the reason I say that is that, you know, we set up a society not based on the goodness of humanity, but on the bankruptcy of humanity, and it's been the best one. Now, that's a secular, that's a, you know, societal thing. What do Christians believe about human beings? Um, anthropo anthropology, there you go. It's not the anthropology like we think about in, in some of the disciplines. Disciplines, but that's that's what we when we talk about what's our anthropology. So um, if you believe human beings just need a good teacher, then what is how does Jesus save us? He comes and gives us a great teaching. We do it. Woo! We're good. We're saved. <clears throat> but if you believe that we are bankrupt, that ultimately yes, we're created by God. That's original blessing. But we also have this thing called original sin. If that we are separated from God and we are in bondage to sin and we cannot save ourselves, then the cross starts to make sense in this, in this sense of sacrifice that Jesus did something for us, suffered for us. You know, the blood of Jesus shed for, you know, the Lamb of God for the sin of the world. So then we go, oh wow, something more radical was needed than a teacher. But it all comes from how you define the problem, see. So, you know, usually how are you defining the problem will dictate what you say Jesus is. If the problem, for instance, is a particular form of government, then Jesus came to what? Bring about a different government. Like, um, you know, I mean, this pushes it a little bit, and I'll start to get myself in trouble here, but um, liberation theology, as it's been called, um, it's, a lot of people say it came out of the kind of grassroots Central American um, 
Latino, Latina world. I'm, I think that's partly true, but, but um, basically, liberation theology says that, that you, human beings are born free but are forever in chains. And these systems, these governments are oppressing people. And, and so Jesus came to break those oppressive systems. And all of a sudden, Jesus starts looking a little Marxist. But, but, um, but there's a part of that in what Jesus did. He did confront the powers. He did, you know, he did, you know, talk about the sheep and the goats. And, and so the powerful people ought to be thinking and listening to Jesus pretty closely. But I think the problem is deeper than a system. It's sin. But of course that sin gets embodied in governments that oppress people. But I think, you know, and I think we need to, but so what it depends. So when you think about theology, you, you always ask yourself, well, how, well, what do they believe about what, what the person is? Here's a question. Us and Baptists. So let's get things close to home. I love Baptists. They're wonderful people. They're committed Christian people. They believe differently about human beings than I do. They don't believe we are bankrupt, we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. They believe we can make a choice for God. That's why they say, have you made a decision for Jesus? They, they do not believe in original sin. That's why they don't baptize babies. One, they don't see baptism as a sacrament, but they don't think babies need baptism <laughs> because they don't believe in original sin. Psalm 51 says, I've been a sinner from my mother's womb. That's good enough for me. But anyway, yeah, but they have different texts and they have different things. So, so even within Christianity, you see, the anthropology, what you believe about the human being, dictates a lot of soteriology. Greg, I have no idea if that was anything of what you were talking about. He had to leave. Okay, so he's gone. So let's move on. No. But those are some of the ologies, and that's, that's you know, that's that's an important, uh, hopefully, a whole thing. Okay, let's go to a different... You've got, then you've got Scientology, but we don't need... That's a whole different kind of ology. Yeah, how widespread is the edict to slay the two years old and below? Because they slayed Rama in the Gospel this morning, but that was tribe of Benjamin, not David. Right. So, um, you know, Matthew sees what Herod does as a fulfillment of this story. And with all New Testament writers, they take some liberty. They're, you know, but they, so Matthew sees that. And so the question is, how widespread was it? Um, I do not believe it was widespread. I think we've heard more about it from other sources. Because we don't hear a lot. I don't, I'm pretty sure that there's no outside source of, other than the Gospel of Matthew about that event. So I think it was Bethlehem. Um, I think the thing we want to think about when it comes to the Victory <coughs> story is that how, how old did Herod go with the slaughter of innocents? Two years. Two, two years. Why would he do that? He would have fallen into it. But why didn't he say three months? Because, see, we don't know when the Magi got there. Tradition says they got there 14 days after, 12 days after, but we don't know how long it was. Jesus could have been a two year old boy. I know that doesn't fit with our, you know, but, but we don't know. So Herod's like, well, I'm going to cover my bases. You know, when was this king born? So the Magi come. And, you know, we want to celebrate things, and so in tradition we sometimes converge things. And that's fine. Who knows? It could have been, but we don't know exactly. So, so I believe, my view would be that if it was all throughout the land, it would have been more well-preserved. But Bethlehem was a backwater, nothing ignored place. So it's not surprising to me that we don't hear about it in some of Herod's many other things. But we do hear all kinds of things about Herod that make us believe, yeah, he'd do that. He'd do that without blinking an eye because of all the horrible other things he did. So, so yeah. So Good. he just take Rama on the way, even though it was Benjamin? Um, I, I, that's where I think Matthew's taken some close enough <laughs> type, of, type of viewpoint. Yeah. Good. All right. Excellent. Other questions? Over here today.
So, as I understand it, Dave, they, they're based in Nazareth up north. They head south to Bethlehem for the birth, and they're hanging out there. Now, um, they're stay, it's, it's a pretty big trek, and if you've got a new infant, my assumption is that they're staying with family um, for a, an extended period of time. And it's here, then, that they head off to Egypt. So, I'm pretty sure that we don't, if they did go back up to Nazareth, that we, Matthew doesn't tell us that. He didn't say they were in Bethlehem, then they went back up to Nazareth, and they got scared about Herod, and then they left. And, um, so please, yeah, well, uh, what got me this morning is it sounded as though from Egypt, Dream, they were given an instruction to go someplace else, but they got concerned about someone there that was dangerous, so they ended up going to the district of Galilee and settled in Nazareth. So I wonder, did they come from Nazareth? Because it said they had returned to Nazareth at that point. Yes. They, uh, yes. So here, let me just go there. Clearly in Nazareth, clearly accurate. Yes. 
not clearly enough. Not, so, sorry. That was a little hard. Yeah, that was like pretty presumptuous of me to, you know, say, well, clearly the Bible's in it. Yes, Kim, please. We've got uh, about five minutes. Sorry, sure, we finished with that question. I, yes. I have a question that's probably going to take longer than five minutes, but okay. we have another denomination that's split. We have the United Methodist yes. denomination that's yes. split. And it, how hard should we be working for unity across Christianity versus saying, okay, we don't agree with each other, we're going to just be the LCA Lutherans and not worry about what other people do. You know, nobody's really more divided than Lutherans. There's so many Lutheran uh, flavors. Yeah. But it seems like that's happening yeah. across the board. So how concerned should we be about that versus working for unity? Um, yeah. The, the, the way I'll go with that question is to kind of look at it as two questions. How, can, how concerned should we be about the split in the United Methodist Church and other splits that happen within the Protestant world? I'll take it. I'll go that. And then, how do we, uh, I'm going to say, how is it that we affirm the unity of the church in all of this? And so I'll go at it that way. Yeah. Okay? So, um, if you haven't heard, uh, back at their General Assembly, I think they have one every year, you know, United Methodist Church is a worldwide communion. This is what most Americans <coughs> don't understand. Like we think of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, that's the, a certain group of Lutherans in the United States. Canada has their own, and, you know, etc. Well, the United Methodist Church, when it was merged, which is a, a merger that happened, and I'm not an expert on the, all everybody that joined into that, um, included Methodists from all over the world. And so when they have a vote approving something or disapproving something, they have delegates, voting members from all over the world. So if you just took the United Methodists in this country, in the United States, they would have passed the approval of gay marriage and gay pastors in married relationships long ago. But the African church, which is the strongest church in the world, not just the United Methodists, but Lutherans, etc., Although Lutherans in Africa, there's the ones in Ethiopia, the ones in Tanzania, they're all, they're all separate organizational groups that, of course, have good connection to each other, but they're separate voting bodies. United Methodist Church, all, in Af all throughout the world, it's a, it's a worldwide community, which is both its strength and its challenge. And that's why, you know, the church, these folks are much more traditional in their view of marriage and human beings, and etc., and so they stopped that from happening. Well, the, the, most of the United Methodists in this country just, they, they can't go on with that. And so they, they, a proposal for splitting the church, creating two different churches, is going to come before their General Assembly. It is not passed. And there are people that think that the African church will not pass it. One, because the financial support it's a really weird situation right now. Christianity is thriving in Africa. There are so many more United Methodists in Africa than there are in this country, and so many more Lutherans in Africa than in this country. Just in Ethiopia, as you've heard me talk many times, Ethiopia has twice the number of Lutherans in just Ethiopia than all the Lutheran groups in this country. They have 9 million Lutheran Christians. No, no, they're not ELCA at all. They're in separate churches. Now, the Makani Yesus Church in Ethiopia, which is the Lutheran Church in Ethiopia, actually broke ties with the ELCA over this issue. Um, broke official ties, because there's a lot of financial... The reason I brought this up is there's more money in the West than in Europe, even though, especially in Germany and England, you know, um, Christianity is only 5% of the population, and we get worried that still 60% in this country. You know, we get worried about that, but 5%. But anyway, there's a lot more money, and so there's a lot of financial support that goes there, but like the Connie Yesus Church said, well, sorry, we're, we, we can't go along with this. So they broke the kind of more intricate ties. But not all, Tanzania Lutheran Church did it. There's still ties. You know, so not all of them did that, but all of them are separate groups of Lutheran. But not the United Methodist Church. See, all the United Methodists in Africa are one group. Because they're all in the whole world. 
So they're going to come at their next general assembly and they're going to vote on whether they split the church. A lot of people are celebrating this. It's like, let's just agree. So now I'm going to your question with him. Let's just agree to disagree. And so we can't live together, so let's be a different church. Like the ELCA said what it said. The way it did it is it said congregations get to choose. So this church decided we're going to stay in the ELCA, but no, we're not going to do gay marriages. Because that will fracture the church and we want to stay together. That was what we voted on 10 years ago or whatever. So, um, but in the United Methodist Church now, and everybody's celebrating this, but here's my concern. Should we be concerned? You know, what people are talking about is what's Silverdale United Methodist Church going to do? They're going to have to decide as a congregation, well, are we going to go with the traditional group largely supported by the African churches and many other fellowships throughout the world? Or are we going to go with this other, more progressive group? And congregations are going to split. They, they will. It's just, that's going to happen. I don't know what the answer is for what the best way forward is, but I think we need to pray very much for them and continue to pray for the DLC on that issue um, and for congregations. Now, how do we, when it comes to ecumenism, um, here's my answer to the second part. Um, we focus on what the core gospel is. And the ELCA has gone out of its way to have these full communion agreements with the United Methodist Church, with the U United Church of Christ Fellowship, and with the Presbyterian Church, and with the Episcopalian Church. Now, not all of those groups are in full communion with each other, but we're in the middle, and they, we all have these, and we're basically saying, we agree on the core gospel. We can affirm each other as Christian, and then celebrate our differences, and admonish each other with our differences. I think our full communion agreement with the Reformed Church is a really good model for that. It's called, they, the, the catchphrase was mutual affirmation and admonition. So we're going to admonish each other, hey, you Presbyterians should think about the real presence of Christ differently. And they're going to say, well, Lutherans, you should do that. And then, But we're not going to, at the end of the day, say, well, we can't eat each other's tables. Um, and I like that. I, like, I personally think that's the way to be ecumenical. Um, go back to the Nicene Creed, which is the ecumenical confession of the faith. That's, you know, that's a way to say, do we all, can we all agree on this? Um, and then, you know, so that's the way to be ecumenical, not organizationally, because I don't think we need to be organizationally one. We're, it's a broken world, and so we're not going to have that. The, the other option is to be like the Catholic Church, or the, now it's, well, I don't even go to the Orthodox Church, because that's really interesting. But, but the Catholic Church, you have a head leader and ties everybody together. That has its advantages and its disadvantages. Just like Winston Churchill said about democracy, you know, well, it's horrible, but it's the best thing we've found. Well, each one has its advantages and disadvantages. And so, um, you know, I like to say different churches meet different people. The Pentecostal church is going to reach people for Christ. I, you know, when I watch some of those Pentecostals on the Christian channels, you know, they're the, whatever those three hundreds. After the weather channel, because that's where I usually ran into. I'm looking for the weather. And say, what is this guy talking about? You know, I mean, I'm just like, oh, it just turns my skin sometimes. I listen to it. But I go, well, maybe they are bringing the gospel and Christ to some people. I can be very judgy about them. But so, how do you be ecumenical? I think that's where we have to check. We have to say, you know, this is my perspective, and I believe it passionately. But I'm not going to judge you. You know. I can say when it comes to what you say, it's like, do you subscribe to the 19th century? That's kind of ecumenical. Whether they're a freedom church or not, you know, what they say. So that's the way to be ecumenical in my view. And I think, but, um, and that's my response. And it, it's a big prayer. And I, my thought is, while everybody's saying, hey, this seems like a great way to go forward to the at this church, I go, what is each congregation going to do? Because I've seen how divisive this issue is. I mean, how it threatens to break apart this church. And I, God bless them. I, 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 you know, I don't know. So. Okay, great question. We are out of time. This was cool. If you want to send me an email about Boy Pastor Bill, I hope we'll study this or that or whatever. Do so. But otherwise, I'll keep praying about it and come to a decision this week. Okay? God bless.
God bless you. Happy